This is Easter, folks. Why are we here? Because on a Friday, Jesus died. He was dead. He was put in a grave. And on Sunday, he rose back to life again. He's alive today. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. I, there's some of you in this room, you're thinking about, you've come here, you love the music and everything, but you're thinking, those people are nuts. <laughs> like 2,000 years ago, this guy rose from the grave, and you're following this guy that was buried 2,000 years ago. And, and I get it. In fact, believing Jesus rose, believing that he lives today, it, without reason to believe that, it would be a giant, wild leap of faith, wouldn't it? I mean, 2,000 years ago? And so if you're one of those sitting here thinking they're nuts, I like them, they're, you know, they sing good and all that, just this is, this is not only for you, this is for those of us that do believe. But it's easier to believe today singing these songs than it might be tomorrow on Monday when difficulties come and we're trying to stretch, did someone really walk out of a grave? Did he really do that for me 2,000 years ago? And so this is for all of us today. I mean, God didn't leave us without reasons to believe Easter's true. He didn't leave us void of reason for that. For many in this room, for me, it's been, I came to believe Jesus rose through seeing God work in the lives of other people. We were in a church and we were in a small group and we saw God do stunning stuff. And out of that reason to believe, I began to follow Jesus and believe as well. And then many of you, it's been in your own life. You've seen Jesus move in your own life and you're thinking it has to be true. He has to be risen. This is what he's doing in my life and I will trust my life to him. But there's something else I want to share with you today. For centuries before Jesus' crucifixion, God had the people of Israel unknowingly rehearse the very details of the crucifixion century after century over and over and over again. Unbeknownst to them, they were actually rehearsing the crucifixion, the details of that. And he'd have them rehearse the details of the resurrection to follow for century after century after century. So let me take you back in time to around 12 to 1400 BC. This is the time of Moses and historians don't know exactly if it's 1200 or 1400. Let's go with 1400 just for simplicity. So the book of Exodus begins and the people of Israel have been held for generations as slaves to the nation of Egypt. It's the most powerful nation on the planet. Their, their symbol was the serpent or the snake. If they flew a flag, it would have the serpent on it. Most powerful nation. And they had these Israelites in this crushing slavery and captivity. And the load on the slaves got deeper and deeper and harder and harder and heavier and heavier, year after year, generation after generation. In the time of Moses, it, be, it became so bad, the Egyptians began to kill the firstborn sons of the Israelites at their birth. There was this harsh slavery and death under the, under the serpent. I mean, they desperately needed to be saved from the serpent. And so God sends Moses nine times to Pharaoh. And his message is, the Lord says, let my people go. And nine times Pharaoh says, no way. And God sends um, a, a, you know, great difficulty of plague and it doesn't soften Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh gets more and more resistant. The plagues get harder and harder and harder. Nine times, after nine times, God says to Moses, he says, I'm going to save you from, from this crushing, deadly slavery of the serpent. And I'm going to save you with a lamb. Now, if you're Moses, <laughs> the dude had been a shepherd. He knew what lambs were capable of. <laughs> think with me for a moment about how defenseless a lamb is. Have you ever seen a lamb with horns? If you think you have, it's not a lamb, it's something else. They don't have horns. They don't have fangs. They don't have claws. They're completely defenseless, totally defenseless. You've heard of attack dogs, but have you ever heard of an attack lamb? No, because there's no such thing. They're the most defenseless animal there is. And God's saying, Moses, I'm going to save my people from this serpent who's been killing you with a lamb. And Moses had to be going, God, you mean a lion, don't you? We could run with that. <laughs> or maybe a bear or maybe an eagle, we could run with that. And God says, no, no, it's going to be a lamb. And, and so let me tell you what I want all the people to do. In the month of Nisan which is, that was their first month of their calendar for us. It's mid-March to mid-April. In the month of Nisan, on the 10th day, I want every household to go out to their flocks and select a perfect, unblemished lamb. No scars, no scratches, completely flawless lamb, a perfect lamb, and then bring it in and then inspect it again on 
the 11th of Nisan and the 12th of Nisan, the 13th of Nisan, be sure it's still this perfect, flawless lamb. And then on the 10th of Nisan, I want each family to kill their lamb. Take specifically a hyssop branch, dip it in the blood of the lamb, go to their door and put it above the door and on the two side posts of the door. And then I want them to go out and put on their walking coats and their walking shoes, their walking sticks, like they're going on this great journey. And then I want them to roast, specifically roast their lamb. Don't boil it, don't bake it, roast. Expose it to the fire, in other words. You're looking puzzled. In Texas, it's barbecue. So you barbecue the lamb. So as you barbecue the lamb, then, as you're sitting there barbecuing the lamb, um, I want you to be pondering what's about to come. The, the lamb is barbecued. You begin to eat the lamb then. When you've finished eating the lamb then, God says, then go into your home that's protected by the blood of the lamb. And on this night, there'll be the angel of death will pass over all of Egypt. And every single firstborn male, uh, humans and animals will die that night, except those protected by the blood of the lamb. So the message is given to Pharaoh what's going to happen, and Pharaoh still doesn't budge at it. So the 10th of Nisan comes along, and people go out, they select a perfect lamb without blemish, without flaw, no scratch, no, no scar on it. They inspect it again on the 11th day, and the 12th day, and the 13th day, the 14th day it comes. And they, they kill their lamb, they take a hyssop branch, they dip it in the blood of the lamb. They go to their doorpost, they put blood above the door and on two side posts of the door. And then they go out and they... They barbecue the lamb. I mean, they expose it to the fire. They barbecue the lamb. Now, this is the 14th of Nisan. The people guarding the Israelites to be sure there's no insurrection. There, there were probably half a million lambs being barbecued in close proximity. Can you imagine if you were guarding them that day? I mean, you couldn't escape the smell of barbecue lamb. And you would go in and then you would see these Israelites, these crazy Israelites, they're dressed in walking coats and walking shoes and walking sticks. And they haven't gone anywhere in their lives, nor had their parents or grandparents or great-grandparents. And they think they're going somewhere. If you were especially observant, you might happen to look at the doors. You might see this bright red mark above the door on the two side posts that were there. Now, one thing I haven't told you is this. When the lamb has been consumed, they were told to through the killing and the barbecuing and the consumption of the lamb, don't break a single bone in the body of the lamb. You can separate the bones at the joint, don't break a... This is a strange thing, isn't it? Don't, you want to eat, don't break a single bone in the body of the lamb. And so then they consume the lamb, careful not to break a bone. And then they go into their homes that night on the 14th of Nisan. And that night, indeed, the angel of death comes... And every single firstborn child, male child, is killed across the land, except those protected by the blood of the lamb. Pharaoh calls Moses in during the night. He doesn't wait for, for sunrise to come. He calls him in. He says to him, well, he, what he doesn't say is, you can go. <laughs> because he says, you have to go. <laughs> you can't stay any longer. You have to go. And you can take whatever you want that is mine and the Egyptian people with you. And they left that night with much of the wealth of Egypt free for the first time. They have this new freedom. Then God says to Moses, I want you to celebrate this every single year so you never forget that I've saved you from the serpent and the slavery and the death thereof by the blood of the lamb. So you'll never forget. So every single year, 10th of Nisan, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th of Nisan, all of that, practice every single detail of it again and again and again. And the people did for a long time. And then they fell away from God, they quit practicing it, but they would return to God and begin to do Passover again, and they would move in and out of that. As the years went by, they made some changes. They came to the promised land, they built cities, they built the temple, they began then to, rather than celebrate in their scattered homes, they would all come to Jerusalem, to the temple, and they would celebrate Passover together there as one huge family being saved from the slavery and death of the serpent then. Now, it didn't take many years, I'm sure, for them to bring their perfect lamb from 80 or 100 miles away through rough roads to figure out when they got to Jerusalem, he wasn't perfect anymore. He had scraped a hoof or something was no longer perfect. So they began to raise those lambs outside Jerusalem. The, the pastors outside Jerusalem, they would raise Passover lambs. People would come in and buy a lamb then and then celebrate Passover. Many years pass. It's about 0 A.D., and there's a child born who is of such importance that God sends angel to announce the birth of this child. 
You might think he would send the angels to the king in his court, but he doesn't do that. You might think maybe to the high priest in the temple, he doesn't do that. He makes the announcement to shepherds guarding lambs in the fields outside of Bethlehem, which is six miles from Jerusalem, which shares the same fields outside Jerusalem and Bethlehem. Most likely they were guarding Passover lambs. They get the announcement. It's Jesus, of course. 30 years pass, and he's been working as a carpenter. He's about to begin this ministry now. He goes to John the Baptist, who is the most uh, famous and uh, prophet of all of Israel's history. He's approaching John the Baptist. He's coming as a carpenter, approaching John the Baptist. John the Baptist sees him and is stirred by the Spirit of God, and he cries out, Behold. He doesn't say, Behold the Messiah. He doesn't say, behold the king of kings, behold the Lord of lords, behold the son of God. He says, behold the lamb of God. And you read what happens to John the Baptist as the gospels unfold, and he had no clue what he was saying. I mean, the dude probably tried to swallow the words back after they came out. Like, the lamb of God. You know, what did I just say? What well, just jumped out of my voice, the lamb of God. For three years, Jesus teaches as no one ever taught. He healed sicknesses and disease and deformities of all kinds. Somewhere around 33 AD, Passover is approaching. It's the month of Nisan. It's, in fact, it's, the, it, it's the, ninth, the ninth of Nisan, Palm Sunday, which Weston talked about so powerfully last week. The, the ninth of Nisan comes, and Jesus goes into, briefly into Jerusalem, looks at the temple, goes back out to the Mount of Olives on the ninth of Nisan. On the tenth of Nisan, when they're beginning to inspect the priests are inspecting the Passover lambs. Jesus comes into the temple, and he is grilled by the priests who are trying to find one single flaw in his life. They can't find one. While there other priests are inspecting Passover lambs, making sure they're flawless. That's Monday. On Tuesday, it's the 11th. The same thing happens. Priests are, are grilling Jesus, looking for one single fault, while others are inspecting Passover lambs. The 12th comes, which is Wednesday. The 13th come, comes as well. They're inspecting, inspecting, inspecting. The 14th, the Nisan comes. Hmm. Night, the day begins at, sunfall for, at sunset for them. Jesus is arrested that night. He's taken in and he goes through a mockery of a trial. He's beaten by the fist of men. His back, his back is shredded with whips. He's declared guilty. And as sunrise comes up, soon afterwards, he goes out. He's, he's forced to carry a cross. He can only carry it part way because of the beating he's taken up to, to Golgotha to Skull Hill. And there at 9 a.m. on the 14th of Nisan, he's nailed to a cross, a thief on each side of him. He's nailed to a cross, which, by the way, the three points of the cross are the very same points on which Passover blood had been placed upon a home all those many years. And we know this now, when he was on the cross, he endured the fire of God's hate and anger against sin, all sin. He took upon himself every single sin of every person of all time, mine and yours both. He, he took them upon himself as though he had committed those sins and he endured the full flame and fire of God's wrath against every single sin while he was there on the cross. The hours are moving on now and he, he's just about to breathe his last. They offer him his final drink on earth. They lift the, the drink up on a hyssop branch, the same branch that had been used with Passover lambs all those many years back. He cries out, it is finished. In other words, it is complete, and he dies. It's the day before Sabbath. The religious leaders don't want people hanging on crosses on, on Sabbath day, so they want them taken down. People, when they're crucified, usually they live for two or three days or longer because they, what they die from is a combination of exhaustion and suffocation. They're hanging on a cross. They're hanging by their hands or by their wrists, and they have to push themselves up on the nails driven through their feet in order to breathe, exhale, and inhale. As long as they can push themselves up with strength, they can inhale and exhale. When they no longer have strength and they can't breathe, they die within minutes. And so the, the soldiers that were going to clear the crosses for Sabbath, which was coming, went out fully expecting to kill three men. They get to the, to the very first one, one of the thieves, 
And they take this iron rod. He's living as they fully expected. They take this iron rod and they break his legs. Within minutes, he suffocates and he's dead. They go to the other thief and as they expected, he's alive as well. They take the iron rod. They break his legs. Within minutes, he'll be dead too, suffocated. They go to Jesus. They raise the rod. To their great shock, he's already dead. And they take him down without breaking a single bone in his body, as had been the case of Passover lambs all these many centuries. He's laid in a grave, 14th of Nisan. I told you that God had them rehearsing the crucifixion and the resurrection. Leviticus 23, they've not yet gotten to the promised land in Moses' day, so it's very early on. God tells them that um, when you get to the land there, you begin to grow crops. I want you to, when the very first crops emerge, I want you to have this celebration of the first of the harvest. He celebrates it's the end of the cold death of winter. The life of spring is here. It's the first harvest, and you'll celebrate the full harvest to come. When you read that, there's no date attached to that. God just says with the first of the harvest, have this great celebration, and that day floated around. It wasn't on any given day, but we know this on the... On the weekend that Jesus died, was crucified, we know that, that the, the harvest day, the celebration, was on the 16th of Nisan. So you do the math, Jesus dies on the 14th on Friday. 15th is Sabbath, everything is still and quiet, nobody's moving. The 16th of Nisan is going to be this huge celebration of the end of the cold death of winter and the new life of springtime. And there are people in their homes that are gathering up all the first fruits for this huge celebration of new life. The very day the stone rolls aside and Jesus rises from the dead. What they had rehearsed again and again and again, over and over and over again. When I was a spiritual seeker, I would read the prophecies about Jesus, and some were very powerful. Isaiah 53 talks about the exact details of how Jesus would die, and it was so... Um, so accurate that people couldn't believe that was about the Messiah. I'd read the prophecies, and, and those would stir my heart some, but it was never quite enough. But somehow when I began to realize that for centuries, the entire nation rehearsed the crucifixion and resurrection before it ever happened, man, that, that, friends, was one of my reasons to believe. Jesus is risen from the dead. He is. The good news to absorb is whoever you are, wherever you stand with faith or no faith, on the cross that day, he took every single one of your sins, even those not yet committed, and he took them on as his own. And he absorbed the full fire of God's wrath for every single sin of you and of me both, every single one. And he rose from the dead. What he's offered is that if we will believe in him, which means if we will trust him to forgive all of our sins, and, and friends, that takes some trust. When I think about my life, to think he, he has forgiven all of mine in my trusting him, to believe we trust him to forgive all of our sins and to lead our lives. We say, you are the one who is the one just person can, who will lead my life. When we do that, every single sin is forgiven. There's a change of eternal address. I mean, one day when you breathe your last, folks, I, there'll be a, a corpse, <laughs> and it may be in a casket or maybe by cremation, but there'll be some physical remains. But if you've been a follower of Jesus, you will have stepped into heaven already. I mean, there'll be some people that were mourning your loss, and very appropriately so, but you won't be there. Man, you will, you will be in heaven, friends. If you came today, I, if you came thinking like Easter is a good thing to be at, and I want to be here and great music if you come, but you come thinking, how would anyone ever believe there's a man that rose from the dead 2,000 years ago who lives today, who knows me, who knows me. Everything I've done, everything I will do has paid the price for all of it. And all I have to do is begin to put my faith in him to forgive every sin and lead my life. That's it. And I'm thinking this, I don't know what your life has been like. And I don't know how long your life will run. I don't know what tomorrow will bring for you. But you have this time now. I mean, this is a time now to know there's a reason to believe. It's not just this blind leap of faith. I mean, it, there's some eyes to this leap of faith. In fact, what I found was it wasn't even a leap when I got there. 
It was this step of faith to believe. This, this, friends, this could be your day to join in as well. This could be the Easter of all Easters for you. To say to Jesus, would you forgive my sins and lead my life? And he's listening to your heart. If you ask him, he will change everything for you. Everything for you. Father in heaven, this is, this is so wild. One that you would love us, those of all of us, broken, sinful we don't even love ourselves a lot. You would love us, love us so much that you and your son Jesus would have this all planned out in agreement that he would come and pay the highest price. And the price wasn't the nails and wasn't a physical death. It was the price of your, your anger, your fire, your hate of sin because sin damages. He would absorb all of that upon himself. And then on Sunday, he would rise back to life again and invite anyone and everyone who will to place their faith in him and follow him. Father, I pray now there's someone in this room who's thinking, you know, I've, I've never trusted him. I've known this story. I've never trusted him. But I have enough reason, just enough reason to believe. I pray in their heart they would say, Jesus, would you forgive me and lead me? I will trust you. And Father, in the moment, like in the moment there's a resurrection that happens right there. Maybe unbeknownst to us, the resurrections happen in this room right now because someone's born to a new life and a life that will never end. Lord Jesus, we worship you with abandon. Oh, my goodness. Uh, you are our everything, rightfully so. We worship you. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.